First step is who's my protagonist, who takes the, the decision and action that uh, brings about the climactic action. The, the deepest, the subconscious, the true motives that are driving uh, a character can never be and should never be explained. They should be implied. But of course, the, the desire to be free as an artist is one of the most suicidal notions you can have. You do not wish to be free. What you wish is to impose upon yourself creative limitations. Uh, desire is the key. What does this character want consciously? And in a complex character, uh, what does this character want subconsciously that somehow is contradicting um, his conscious desire or her conscious desire. What you do is you put your character under pressure. You first of all have to understand who your character is, then you have to put them under pressure, let them make choices, take actions, and instantly, if you do it beautifully, instantly the audience of the reader goes, oh, wow, and they get it. Wow them in the end, you got hit. You can have flaws, problems, but wow them in the end you've got a hit. Your characters must change. And the change must come from them. Uh, the first question to identify is uh, who's the protagonist of this story? And generally it's going to be the point of view character, the character with whom uh, we spend the most time. Uh, but there are exceptions, and so uh, if, you, for, if you've got a film, for example, you can go to the end of the film and in your study, start there, and discover who makes the crisis decision to take uh, the climactic action. Uh, that would be the protagonist. Who is the character who carries out the crisis decision, climactic action? Um, and so that character may appear late in the film, that character may share the, uh, the film with another character and so forth. So anyway, that First step is who's my protagonist, uh, who is determining, who takes the, the decision and action that uh, brings about the climactic action. Uh, because writers, like all artists I would imagine, uh, wish to be free. They don't, they don't like the idea of limitation. They want to be free, free to do anything that they want. Uh, but of course the, the, the desire to be free as an artist is one of the most suicidal notions you can have. You do not wish to be free. What you wish is to impose upon yourself creative limitations. And the setting is the first level of creative limitation. Only certain things are possible and are probable in certain worlds, and that strict limitation of what can happen in that particular world will, rather than inhibit you, it will inspire you. I promise. The, the deepest, the subconscious, the true motives that are driving uh, a character uh, can never be and should never be explained. They should be implied. What you do is you put your character under pressure. When, when things are really at stake, when, when, when the forces of life are, are compelling the character to make a choice and take an action in an effort to put their life back into balance. How that character chooses that specific character, what they choose to do under that specific pressure is who they are. And as a result, the audience's mind, or the reader's mind, goes through the surface and goes, ah, we understand who they are by implication of their action. So that's how you do it. You first of all have to understand who your character is, then you have to put them under pressure, let them make choices, take actions, and instantly, if you do it beautifully, instantly the audience of the reader goes, oh, wow, and they get it. Uh, desire is the key. What does this character want consciously? And in a complex character, uh, what does this character want subconsciously that somehow is contradicting um, his conscious desire or her conscious desire. Uh, is there a deep inner conflict in this character between what they think they want in this, uh, in this situation 
uh, what they want out of life, and what they are they their own worst enemy? Is there an unconscious desire that contradicts that? Um, an exercise in imagination um, that you would sit down and if you can draw, fine, uh, draw a character as best you can, or if not, create word pictures of the, uh, the character, uh, their, their hair, their face, their body, uh, their style of clothing, and just try to create uh, the physical picture of this character. And then ask your imagination, what kind of person would he be if he or she uh, looked like this? And, um, and follow that vivid outer, uh, all those outer traits of characterization uh, around and take them, uh, take them on the rides with you in your car and take, um, and take this character to, um, you know, the grocery store and let people think you're schizophrenic you know, when you talk to people. But, uh, you know, lead them down and ask them what kind of a, you know, grocery cart would he fill? What would be his f food choices? Um, and see, it's a simple exercise of starting with, uh, with no particular story in mind, just an assemblage of traits, uh, including the voice and how this character might talk, and you come to know this character, this imaginary character, they will um, they'll begin to suggest to you that they have desires, that they might, you know, when you take them to the grocery store, they might want uh, something to eat that would be uh, really surprising, and then you might ask them why, and, the, and they might have a reason out of their life history why this food. Uh, they begin to have certain desires, uh, and, um, uh, and that's when you begin to trace uh, what the character wants. And if you can stay with that character long enough and try one desire versus another to make a list of these things, you may come up with something that will surprise you in terms of what is the character's really deep desire. If they handle exposition beautifully, generally means this is somebody who's really, even though they haven't been made or produced or whatever, this is somebody who has thought deeply about the craft and knows how to draw the reader into their story and not tell them and burden them with exposition too soon and too heavy-handedly, but draws it with curiosity and empathy into the story and in directly, invisibly, as it were, we're gathering in the exposition that we know, but we're not conscious of it. That, that technique alone requires years of practice and um, trial and error. And so the answer is always yes. You could do anything you want, but does it work or not work? And, and you know, often you're never going to get an answer to that until you finally write it, <clears throat> put it in front of people, see how they react to figure out does, does, does it work or not. Um, and, um, and so you have, to, uh, you have to experiment and try and test it on people. And the answer is... Um, could I do it? Of course you could do it. Uh, the reason is why are you doing it? Uh, and, um, and, and how do you make it work? My first uh, and best piece of advice is learn to think in terms of contradictions. Create dimensionality in characters by building consistent contradictions within the character. Um, and so um, uh, in one scene or in many scenes, perhaps, to certain kinds of characters, uh, your protagonist is a very kind person. But they're also capable of turning around in um, different situations with different kinds of characters and uh, behaving with, uh, with great cruelty. And this contradiction between kindness and cruelty, at one moment they're, they're, they're very gentle and loving, uh, but for other people at other times um, they're really a hard ass and even um, sadistic, thinking in terms of dynamic contradiction like that begins to build uh, dimensional characters. Ask yourself, what are your favorite films? Or if you want to write prose, what's your favorite novels? What's your favorite plays? What's the, what is the, if you had to go to a desert island, you know, what would be the six um, the stories that you would take with you? As you watch them, 
ask yourself, what is the most attractive aspect of that story to you? What do you really love about that story? Is it one of the characters? Is it a relationship between the two characters? Is it the events that turn somehow in, in surprising and uh, very um, uh, pleasing ways for you? Is it uh, the setting of the story? See if there's a pattern. See if it's always character, if it's always event, if it's always uh, some aspect of setting, uh, some kind of a particular sense of humor, certain jokes that you respond to, certain emotions that uh, certain scenes cause you to feel. In character-driven stories, is the payoff always emotional? Um, I, I don't think always. I don't. I mean, I can't. You know, I, I'm sure that there are there are payoffs in character-driven stories. There may be a payoff. There may be, um, in which we get a an understanding, an intellectual understanding of ah, this is what caused this character to behave the way they are behaving. Okay, and so you have an insight into the psychology that is a pure kind of clinical insight. Um, the, the classic cliche, you know, the the child. Uh, uh, an abused childhood, okay? Um, but I would think that that if we care about this character and we're involved, that the discovery of a particular abuse would have um, a, a intellectual power. And so I, I, I would the answer is, could a turning point reveal something that is only, a clinical kind of uh, you know, intellectual knowledge, yes. Without any emotion surrounding it, the answer would be yes. Uh, but then the next question would be, why would you want to do that? Why would you just want to give information from the past? Why haven't you told the story in such a way that when we discover uh, what happened in the past, that it... Uh, it does, it, 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 it deeply moves us.